Uh, what got you there with got you got you? What got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there uh, with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? Sean thinks today's guest is one of the most interesting people in the world, and if you're going to listen to one episode of What Got You There, this could be it. Today's guest is Nick Kakonis. Nick Kakonis is co-owner and co-founder of Alinea, Next, Royster, and The Aviary. He manages the marketing, business development, and strategy for current and future business operations. Alinea has been named three times the best restaurant in North America. Next was named the best restaurant in America, and The Aviary was named best bar in America. He is also the founder and CEO of Talk Incorporated, a reservations and CRM system for restaurants with more than 2.5 million diners and clients in more than 20 countries. If that wasn't enough, he has co-authored three books, including The Aviary Cocktail Book, which has sold $2.5 million since November. Yes, he has also completely disrupted the publishing industry. This episode is going to uncover Nick's decision-making framework, his creative process, and so much more. Hey guys, I want to tell you about the brand I'm obsessed with right now. And you guys know I'm pretty obsessive about the brands I work with, especially when it comes to athletic apparel. You guys need to check out 10,000. You need to head to 10,000.cc and you guys can enter code WGYT and you're going to receive 20%, yes, 20% off your entire order. Why do I love 10,000? 10,000 created the only training shorts you'll ever need. They do so by simplifying your options to deliver three premium shorts that perfectly cover all the ways you train. They have one built for versatility, another for durability, and one super lightweight, perfect for one of those runs or whatever else you do for fitness. No matter what you do, they have you covered. CrossFit, running, spin, yoga, lifting, or your weekend adventure, it doesn't matter what you do for fitness. They have a short for every way you train. They make it super simple too to find the right short. Just pick the short that's best for you, your lifestyle, personalize it with your individual needs with a custom liner and inseam options and start getting after it. Not sure if they have the right short? No need to worry, you guys. Make a return or exchange. They offer free shipping, free exchanges, and free returns on every order. Like I said, 10,000 is my favorite brand right now. I am wearing their apparel all the time when I'm working out. I can't recommend them enough. Head to 10,000.cc, enter code WGYT, and you've got 20% off your entire order. You guys know how much I love travel. So I think you're really going to like this next brand. That brand is Globekick. Head to globekick.com, check out what they've got going on, and you can also enter code WGYT to receive 10% off. Globekick makes your travel dreams a reality. They make it easy to discover, plan, and enjoy unforgettable adventures. And you're wondering what some of those adventures are? How about a yoga retreat in Italy? Cage diving with great whites in South Africa? Or their most recent trip was dog sledding and chasing the Northern Lights. Yes, they saw the Northern Lights. I think you guys would love checking them out. So head to globekick.com, enter code WGYT, and you've got 10% off. Nick, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? I'm really well, Sean. How are you? I'm doing very well. This is a conversation I've been looking forward to for a while. But I want to start where you just mentioned you were. You just picked up a cup of coffee. What does Nick Konis go to at 1 o'clock in the afternoon for a little pick-me-up? <laughs> You know, uh, usually nothing. Um, but, uh, today I went and got a shot of espresso. So pretty basic. Is, is that usually what you go with even in the morning? You're more of an espresso guy. Yeah. I, I usually don't eat breakfast. I usually have uh, a macchiato, um, and go, which, you know, for a long period of time, everybody I knew told me that was a terrible thing to do, but now people are kind of going like, Oh, maybe that's not such a terrible thing is, you know, Maybe, maybe breakfast isn't the most important meal of the day. So I guess I've been doing some sort of periodic fasting without knowing it for 20 years. Leading the edge there on the cutting edge of, I, of what's healthy. Accident. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, I mean, you mentioned then that you skip breakfast. Anything else you do in the morning or even at other points in the day that are kind of atypical? Uh, boy, I don't know. I, I uh, you know, honestly, I don't. If I'm if I'm fully engaged in something, I just I just do that, and then uh, I'm not really much of a snacker or or anything like that. But conversely, I don't really 
I'm not a, a, a huge routine habit kind of person where I go like, Oh, every day I need to do the following three things to be an optimal performance or whatever. I just, I just live, you know, I just kind of go. Absolutely. Nothing wrong with that. What about in terms of time? Is there anything you do dividing up your time? Do you usually have strict hours? You're working, you're out golfing, you're doing these things. No, not actually. No. Um, you know, I'm not a morning person. I tend to like my night times. Um, and, uh, much to the chagrin of my wife, um, who is an earlier morning person than I am. She's annoyed if I sleep until seven or seven 30, uh, in the morning. And, uh, I'm going like, I could sleep till 10 every day and stay up till two. Uh, I've always been that way. Uh, I kind of like having some isolated time at night. Um, but other than that, I don't think anything's terribly atypical. In terms of the isolated time at night, is, is there anything you do? Do you just like to unwind with a glass of wine and watch some TV or is it, or is it more business productive activities? Yeah. I mean, it depends on the night. Like I definitely enjoy uh, a glass of wine or two. Um, and then, uh, you know, some nights, if I've got not a lot going on, I, I'll, I'll, I'll get on, you know, I'll do what everyone else does. I get on Netflix or HBO or something like that. I almost always watch on my computer these days. I'm rarely in front of a television. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I could go a month and not watch any sort of entertainment like that. And, uh, and then other times I get really into a show and, and just binge it just like anyone else. <laughs> any so, great shows recently? You know, uh, I watched uh, Casa de Papel, you know, Money Heist, which is, uh, you know, fun Spanish language, um, you know, uh, TV show. Um, I love watching sort of, I'm a documentary person, so I love watching documentaries. I just saw the Apollo 11 documentary yesterday, rare that I go to a theater, but I uh, really wanted to see that on a big screen and that was really wonderful. Awesome. Well, I mean, while that espresso is still kicking in, I want to have a little bit of fun. Besides one of your restaurants, what's the last truly great meal you've had out? Oh man, that's, I'm really fortunate in that regard. Um, you know, I was just down in, uh, I was just down in Argentina and, um, in Buenos Aires, uh, and I went to a place called Tegui that was really wonderful. Um, it was super high end. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of one of those world's 50 best tasting menu places, but the ingredients were, were all indigenous to Argentina and were, a lot of them were new to me, which is pretty rare these days. Um, and it was just really exciting to be at a restaurant like that, that was performing at a high level and also, um, was had, you know, these like, uh, Papa Chunia they're called. I'm trying, probably pronouncing that wrong, but I'm trying to do it by memory. Um, and there are these, these, uh, tiny little potatoes that are like stones that are dehydrated naturally in the soil, um, because of the cycle, the freeze thaw cycle. Um, and man, like I'd never seen anything like it. They look like little rocks and then they kind of made them into a paste. Uh, and apparently that's been, you know, thousands of years of people doing that in, uh, in uh, South America, but totally new to me. So I love discovering things like that. Like I think most people do. Um, and then of course we had a couple of great steakhouses down there and stuff as well, but it was just really fun to get to a completely new culture. Yeah, a little bit of travel, experiencing new things. It's something I love to do. A lot of the guests we've had on the past, similar as well. Is it tough for you to just have a normal meal, being so involved, having so many of these great opportunities in amazing restaurants? Uh, absolutely not. You know, I, I actually prefer that. Um, it's often the case now where if I go out to dinner, um, I could even be like a hamburger place or something. And then, you know, they recognize me and so all of a sudden you get every hamburger on the menu, <laughs> uh, which I, I, I am totally appreciative of, uh, in the sense that I know they're, they're being nice and they're being hospitable. Uh, on the other sense, um, I, you know, I'm going to get fat someday. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, sometimes you, you're just out with your family and you just want a quick bite. So some of my favorite restaurants, um, are places where I know the folks locally and they could absolutely give two shits at whether I come in or not, which is, <laughs> that's, that's what I prefer. I really do. Um, and, uh, no, it's not hard for me to eat normal meals at all. I love, you know, I, I was a picky eater growing up and whatnot. And, um, so like my, my things are, I still like, you know, a steak free and, you know, like you give me a good pasta bolognese any day. Um, uh, those are preferred meals for me. So it's always cool to hear that someone not being in the restaurant industry. I, I'm always wondering about that. I just got back from a little wine tasting out in Napa. So I have to ask this question. If you could only have one more bottle of wine, what would it be? 
Uh, well, this one's going to sound really cliche. Um, I'll give you two. I'll give you two price points. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, DRC is one of those rare things in the world. Domain de Romane Conti is is one of the rare things in the world that is expensive as all heck for a reason. Um, and that'd be my last my last bottle of wine for sure. Um, the lower end price point of that would, would be with I would go with like a Gerard Raffe, um Le Boussier, which is a, a, a red Burgundy as well. Um, I'm a big Pinot Noir guy. I think everyone ends there um, in their course of, you know, personal wine education. Um, everyone starts with kind of like the big reds, then you figure out the subtlety to white wine, and then you kind of end up at Burgundy, um, red Burgundy, um, specifically. Um, so it'd be some sort of red Berg and, uh, you know, a simple meal and I'd be pretty happy. No, I appreciate the, uh, the two price points there. I'm sure the listeners will as well. I want to jump into your Twitter bio. It starts off. I am not employed. Why did you feel the need to put that down there? Well, it says I'm not unemployed. My, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Typo there. Yeah. Uh, not unemployed. You know, it, it says I'm not unemployed. I'm not safe for work. NSFW. Um, uh, you know, I saw that somewhere a long time ago, like 15 years ago, and I kind of adopted it. Um, people often didn't understand what I do. Like, so I would go pick up my kids I remember one day I was picking up my kids when they were little from either first grade or preschool or something like that. And, um, one of the moms, you know, it was all moms there. And I was like the only dad at like noon picking my kid up and they said, uh, Hey, you know, how's the job hunt coming? They just assumed I was unemployed. (laughs) (laughs) And I wanted to say like, no, I'm not unemployed. Like, and you know, the double negative is, is different than saying, I am employed because I'm not really employed either. You know, it's somewhere in the middle. Like I, I think the last time I got like a, a paycheck paycheck was like probably before you were born. It was like 1991 or something like that, you know? Um, and you know, I, I kind of just went, yeah, it's really tough out there right now. Like, <laughs> it's like, what do you, I don't really feel like explaining to her what I, what I did, but I didn't. And at the time we were living in the suburbs of Chicago and I didn't really conform to I think the expectations of the peer group that was out there, um, you know, a lot of professionals, a lot of nine to five type folks. Um, and I just never, I never really wanted that or, or thought that that was a good way to value my time. So, I mean, my least favorite question probably is what do you do for work? So, so, so what's your answer these days? Um, I, well, you know, I, it depends what kind of mood I'm in. Um, uh, and, and also, I, you know, sometimes I say I'm a writer and then they say, what do you write? And I say about 300 emails a day. Um, and that's, that's, you know, sort of the stark reality for a lot of people. Um, but also I don't really get that question much anymore because people just know the restaurants, you know? And so I think what people are more surprised by is, is what I do for the restaurants, which is different than they think, you know, they, I have a Greek last name. My, my dad was Greek of Greek ancestry. And so I think that people who don't really know what kind of restaurants I do or don't know me personally, just assume that I'm at the restaurants every day, which is actually not really true. And, and then secondly, they, they kind of just know that like, oh, like you, you own the restaurants. Uh, I think they're also surprised when I'm fully, when they find out I'm fully engaged. Um, you know, I think a lot of people just think like, oh, I wrote a check and I'm an investor in a restaurant. Uh, I'm an investor in a lot of different kinds of businesses where I don't do any of the active work there on a day-to-day basis. But the restaurant group, the Alinea group, um, I work on every single day. And then Talk, the software platform for restaurants, I work on every single day. Um, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm a serial entrepreneur is, is really what I am. And uh, deep down, I still consider myself a trader. We're going to get a lot into the restaurants that you're trading but I want to get into your backstory. And you've mentioned in the past that you modeled after your dad and, and his saying, own your own situation. What things was he doing when you were growing up that, that you decided to model after? Yeah. You know, my dad, um, what, what he used to say was that he was an entrepreneur by necessity because no one would ever hire him. Um, his dad was passed away when he was young. I think he was 14 or 15 when his dad died. Um, 
he had an older sister and a brother and two younger sisters. Um, and in that traditional family, like, it's not like his mom was going to go to work back then. Um, so he was working at like a, a, a green grocery store, a small green grocer on Chicago Avenue in Chicago from the time he was 13 or 14 years old. Um, grew up decidedly, you know, on the lower end of middle class at best. Um, and, uh, served both in the Navy at the end of world war two, and then the army in at the, uh, beginning of the Korean war. Um, and when he came back, he, he bought that green grocer that he worked at from the time he was 14. You know, the guy kind of sold it to him cause he knew the operations from the time he was a little kid. And by the time I was born, which was many years after that, um, he, my dad had me when he was 42, um, he uh, was running a temporary labor office that supplied unskilled labor to factories. Um, and, you know, he used to get up every day at 3.45 in the morning, um, go to work because that's the, all, all the, 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 the men needed to be at work by, you know, factories, you know, work 7, 7.30, 8 o'clock. Um, and then he'd be home by noon or 1 o'clock. So he was a very active parent in that when I got home from school, my dad was almost always home. Um, and whatever, you know, extracurriculars I was engaged in, he was always one of the few dads there if it was a day game or something like that. Um, so that was great. It was really great to have someone who was an entrepreneur who, you know, was doing the books back then with an old time, you know, calculator, the kind that, you know, had that like printout on top, you know, like that thing, you know, um, and, uh, you know, man, like it just always seemed to make sense to me that like. Hey, you should own a business. Um, and what's funny is that his advice to me was always like, you know, go become a lawyer or a doctor or something like that. Like, don't, don't put yourself in the stress of owning a business. And meanwhile, everything that he was doing was showing me that like, Hey, when he wanted to take a day off to do something, he could, like he wasn't answering to anyone. So what he said and what he modeled, I think were two different things, but he was very pro education because he himself felt he was a really smart guy but he never went past high school because he kind of couldn't, you know? So I think he instilled a value of the education for me, but ended up being for different reasons, I think, than what he had anticipated it would be. So then were you, when you were younger, were you thinking you were going to go down that entrepreneurial path or or did you think education was key? Uh, Both, I guess. So I, I felt I was very, Um, fortunate that I had a lot of really great teachers who encouraged me. Um, I did very well on, in school always, um, mostly because I, I really honestly felt the sense of obligation to my parents. Um, but also because it came easy for me. Like I, like school was never difficult. Even when it was challenging, it was never, it never felt hard. It just felt like, Oh, I got to learn AP chemistry. Okay. I'll learn AP chemistry. Um, the only exception to that may have been foreign language, but mostly because I just found the process tedious, like the way that they used to teach it. It's so fascinating that you were so gifted in terms of school overall, but then what you're doing today, it wasn't exactly in the fields you thought it might be. I mean, you studied philosophy at Colgate. Any stories from there that truly shaped who you eventually became? I mean, so many. Um, you know, I, I, I've, I've talked elsewhere about um, Professor Jerome Balmuth who was a tenured professor there for 50 or 60 years. He passed away last year at 94 years old. Um, And he really took me under his wing and forced me to learn how to be logical, how to write very well and succinctly. Um, I'm consistently, like I never thought I had any sort of special skills coming out of there, to be honest with you. Um, You know, he drove me really hard. Um, but again, it was, it felt fun. Like it was a dialogue. It was always, um, it was always about the engagement of ideas for their own sake and for the ability to, to really ask basic questions, um, and then really t- wrestle with the ensuing ideas. Um, it was great. Like I just had a great experience there. I was incredibly unfortunate when I got out, I, I, I found out that like, I was a good writer. Like I knew how to write and, uh, um, boy, that's invaluable. I am consistently amazed at some of the really, really smart people that I hire, um, who, when they need to write a business email or something like that, simply, simply don't know how to do it. Um, 
and uh, don't do it well. And so that's, I think, been a uh, huge part of what that gave me. Um, and I also studied, I loved theater um, back then. Um, and I, I studied uh, in England um, philosophy for, for a semester and also took theater there. So I went to, you know, dozens and dozens of plays and, you know, all business is storytelling. Like you need to be able to tell your story. And when you think about a lot of the great business people, um, you know, the reason why people know who Steve Jobs is, is because he would get on stage and tell the story of the product so well. Um, and that's something you need to do no matter what business you're in, whether it be the restaurants or software or anything else. Yeah, we've had multiple people bring that up. Say there's a potential employee who you think is brilliant, can really add value to your business, but can't write well. Is there any direction you give them, resources, classes, things of that nature? No, you know, teaching teaching writing is, is hard unless you like to read. <laughs> so it's more like one of the questions I ask people when I interview them um, is, you know, what are the last 10 books you've read? Uh, and I gotta tell you, I couldn't answer that, not because I don't read, but because it's really hard to remember the last 10 books. It'd be like, if I said, well, who are the last 10 people you met for the first time? Um, at least for me, it's really hard to remember. Like I can remember a great one that I read two years ago, but I might not remember what I'm reading last week, you know? Um, but what it does is it filters people who are readers versus not readers. It also lets me know really quickly, um, who lies to you because <laughs> it's very clearly that my expectancy is that I want them to be readers. So if they lie and say, oh yeah, yeah, I love to read. And they just name a bunch of like pop culture books, but know nothing about them. Uh, that's a great filter. Uh, and then occasionally I'll have someone that says like, you know what? I don't read at all. And I'll go like, well, what do you do for your intellectual stimulation? And they're like, you know, I had this one guy who was like, I love, I'm a woodworker. So whenever I have a spare moment, I go to my wood shop and he pull up his phone and start showing me some pictures of what he does and how he designs it and all that. And I was like, that's great. Like that, that counts. You know what I mean? Like that guy's passionate about what he's doing and was really talented at it. And that was just his hobby. And so that's, that's great too. You know, did you pick that filtering question up from someone else? No, I, I made it up um, a long time ago because I would always kind of start asking people like, what, you know, what do you like to do? Um, and what I was really trying to get at is like, what are your intellectual curiosities? Um, I, I don't really, it doesn't really do me any good as a business if you like to play tennis. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, but, but like if, you know, if, if, well, I love reading about the Renaissance Okay. Like that's something that we can use in a way. Right. Um, and it tells me what their intellectual curiosities are. So if you're intellectually curious, you can learn almost anything. If you try to escape that all the time, um, in your life, then you're probably not going to learn what we're doing very well. Are there any questions you've used throughout the years to, to, to really dig deep on people and find out what's the core out, out of them? No, I mean, I generally ask that. And then I left, I, I tell them that the rest is self-selecting. Like nobody wants to come work somewhere and not contribute. Right. And so the thing that I really do is turn it on them and let them ask me questions about the business, just even to see where their motivations are. Like someone came, the first question that someone had the other day with talk, they were interviewing for a position at talk is what's your exit strategy? Worst, po worst possible thing that they could say to me. That's like that's a hundred percent non-starter. Like you haven't worked here a day and you're wondering how we're all going to get out. <laughs> I mean, I get that people are motivated by money, but that's, that's not the best first question to ask me, you know? Um, you know, conversely I had, you know, I've had some really intelligent questions going like, you know, you, you've been, uh, I had someone ask me, you know, you were already very successful in the restaurant side. Why start a software company at all? Even though you've done that twice before, seems like you didn't need it. Like what was, what compelled you to do it? Um, that gets to motivation, which is really useful. 
um, gets to the why of why we're doing this. Um, and I thought, you know, it was like, it was, a, it was like a natural flowing conversation. Um, the exit strategy thing is just basically like, I just don't, I don't have one <laughs> next. <laughs> so, so, I mean, you, you mentioned that one question about more about your why. So then how did you actually respond to that about what, what the idea, why you decided to, to go so far into talk? Yeah. I mean, in the restaurant business, like I came here, I came into restaurants without knowing anything about them. Uh, I had no idea how to run a restaurant. Uh, I asked a lot of naive, you know, beginner type questions when I got going on it and then followed through in ways that led me to a path where I went, well, no one's got a good answer for this. You know, um, the, the booking process for restaurants or your dentist or whatever is, is really broken, um, for 2019. It was modeled around a 1935 model of a telephone. And now our telephones are very different. Um, and when I realized that in X number of years, be it five, 10 or 20, whatever it may be, um, the way that we book services will be fundamentally different than the way it was when I started this whole thing in 2010. Um, I couldn't let go of that idea. Like, I feel like I can see the future and it's really clear to me how that's going to work. And yet I keep waiting for someone else to do it because I'm getting annoyed that, that it's not working that way now. Um, I think that's the core root of every entrepreneur, right? Like you see the world a little bit differently and instead of waiting for someone else to do it, you just decide to do it yourself. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's really funny every now and then Grant Ackett's, you know, my chef, um, business partner, uh, you know, genius guy to Linnea every now and then he's, he, he's working on something in the kitchen and he'd be like, yeah, if only we didn't have any customers, you know, because like the thing that's fun is that act of creation. And sometimes some of the dishes that he might create are the kind of thing that work well for one or two people, but not for 90 or a hundred a night. Um, and so, you know, you get to that point where you're like the act of creation itself is really satisfying and whether or not it's commercially viable or like, you know, with talk, we are adding five new restaurants every day right now as clients on, on the platform. Um, once you have clients, you have problems, like you have humans on the other end that are now um, part of your business. Um, that part's not as fun. It never is. That's a grind. Um, but that's all part of it as well. And if you want to get it to the end point, uh, you have to go through that, the, the pain and learning process of, of how, how people, humans really use something, which is often very different than the way you think they will. You're really doing a great job showing your frameworks and, and how you view problems in life. So I'm so interested. You, you've said in the past that you fluttered around a bit after dropping out of law school. What was the narrative like in your head when you, you didn't really have much direction? Yeah. I mean, let me say, I didn't really drop out of law school so much as I, I never went. Um, <laughs> I got there for about a day and went, Oh, not, not really formed. <laughs> um, so I, I guess you could call that dropping out. It was more like I was accepted and never fully, fully went. I like how you uh, worded it better. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, not, I don't, not that I would mind if, if I dropped out of law school. Um, it was a great decision not to go, but I just want to be clear. I never really went. Um, that said, like, you know, I, I was, I was the same then as I am now. I'm terrified all the time. Like people always be like, what motivates you? And I'm like fear. Um, and that sounds like a terrible thing, but like, I don't know. I know some professional athletes that just don't like to lose very much. And it's not so much that they like winning, um, as much as they don't like losing or doing something well, like you could actually lose if you're outplayed and that's, you could admire the person, but if you lose for yourself, um, that's, that's a real fear. And so I think, um, I'm motivated by a fear of not living up to possibilities, be it my own or the world's. Um, and I was terrified, like, you know, I, I, I really couldn't imagine myself going to work at a nine to five job. And for a little while I worked as, um, 
on the governor's campaign here in Illinois because I kind of knew somebody and they recruited me into that. Um, and I got to use some of my writing skills and like, that was interesting, but then you see the sausage factory and you don't really want to do that. Then before I, I was set to go to law school, I worked at the attorney general's office for a summer here in Chicago. And that was just awful, like just terrible. Like I couldn't imagine at 21 or 22 years old showing up when I was 40 years old and going to work like that every day. Like it just blew my mind that anybody would want to do that. So then I became really scared because I was like, well, shit, I need to figure something out. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was just, uh, you know, it just seemed like a, a terrible, a terrible, like it just seemed like a, a job and it's an important job too, by the way, but it seemed like a job that most people were just showing up for. Like I have to come here every day. I got to grind some stuff out. I have to be as productive or look as productive as possible, but it wasn't like anyone loved what they were doing there. And, um, it was just a wake up call that I really, really, really needed to figure out something that was different than that for me. So that wake up call occurs essentially. How soon after that do you begin your career in derivatives trading? Well, it was probably about a year and a half. Um, I spent a, a while where, I literally sat down and I thought, well, what do I know? Like people say you should do what you know. And I was a college student. And so I thought, you know, well, I was, you know, I just got out of college. Like what do college students buy? And I, I made it, I remember making a list on a piece of paper. I mean, just that stupid. And number one on the list was beer. And number two was blue jeans. <laughs> and I was like, these are both pretty well covered, you know? <laughs> uh, and, uh, I got down and I kind of got to the point where I went like, you know, posters that was like way down the list, but it was the first one on the list where I'm like, I don't think anyone has that covered, you know? And this was a long time ago. So it wasn't like I could just get on the internet and type in posters, you know? Um, and so I, I had to do some research and found out that all the museum posters that you see up on kids, dorm room walls and specifically women, um, are, are, are kind of of that Monet, Monet, Duano, like it's the, it's the guy and the girl kissing underneath the Eiffel Tower. Um, amazingly, these have not changed in the last 25 years. Um, and I was like, well, here is a captive audience that gets a new apartment or dorm room every, you know, year or eight months or whatever. And then they tack up some posters up on the wall. Like they want some artwork. Um, and so I started a business just selling um, posters to college students, um, and mostly to women through, through their sorority organizations. And the very first one of those sales that I had generated more money than I would have made in a year at an investment bank. Like it wasn't that hard, you know? Um, and I, you know, I had to go to Uline and buy mailing tubes. like I did everything myself. Right. Um, and I started buying mailing lists back then, like you know, old school mail lists and mailing new doctors and lawyers offices. So I'd download, uh, not download, I would get by a, a mailing list of every new dentist office that opened in Chicago in the last six months because they would need artwork too. And, um, partnered with a framer and, you know, it's like I could go in in a day, sell 15 or $20,000 worth of frame posters to, you know, to an office, uh, hire someone to go hang them up and, and done, you know, um, and once you do that once or twice and all of a sudden you make $5,000 in a day, um, you go, well, shit, like that's what I would have made in a month at Goldman Sachs. Now, in some ways that's short sighted because I'm not learning any, any, like I'm not learning about investment banking or whatnot. Um, on the flip side, I learned everything I needed to learn about running a business, like, you know, incorporating and, you know, the tax filings and sales tax and all those kind of basic things. I learned on a sole prop thing. Now it was very lonely and very boring. Um, and it was the kind of thing where I was like, well, I don't really want to do this forever. And, uh, it was at that point where I, you know, I kind of bumped into a high school friend and, uh, I saw that he had done really well at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and sought out, um, a job down there. What was it that really drew you to the Merck at that time? What, was there one thing? Was I mean, it seems like it wasn't just about money for you. No, it was it was partially about the money and the opportunity. It was also um, independence uh, more than anything else. Uh, you know, you could 
you could judge your day by, by your own efforts. You know, I think oftentimes when you work in a big corporation or even a small company, it's very hard day to day to judge whether or not you've made any progress. Um, whereas trading back then was very visceral and very primitive and very easy to judge how well you were doing every day. It was like playing a game of full contact chess, <laughs> you know, like chess that like you'd make a lot of decisions. And when, when you, you know, when your pawn got taken, someone punched you in the face. Um, and sometimes literally, um, <laughs> sounds yeah. like you're creating new sport here. <laughs> Well, you know, and, and I, 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 I loved it, man. I gotta tell you, it was, you talk to any of the, the, the people that, that were doing that, you know, back then 15, 20 years ago now, and it's sort of almost like a fraternity where they kind of go like, yeah, that's gone. That whole lifestyle and that whole way of life is gone, but they do so with a lot of nostalgia, even though for a lot of them, it was a really tough period of their life. Like not everybody did great down there, right? It was a zero sum game. So what did you walk away from learning the most? You mentioned your, your decision-making process. So was it your ability to make clear, concise decisions while dealing with a great deal of stress? Yeah, for sure. And also to live with those decisions, which is the better piece of things. Can you go deeper on that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, so many times we, we, we make decisions in life and then you recognize three or four months later that it's, it was a bad decision, right? So everyone kind of goes, oh, well, that was a bad decision. And it's like, well, no, maybe it wasn't a bad decision. Maybe that was the best possible decision that you had to make at the time. And it could have been a good decision with a bad outcome, or it could have been a bad decision with a good outcome. And those false positives or false negatives are what you need to distinguish. Um, and so, you know, my thing is you could, you can make the right decision and lose. Um, and you do that a lot when you're trading where you make the right decision. It just doesn't work out. Um, it also happens that sometimes you make some totally boneheaded decisions that end up working, but you can't like those decisions. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine if like a pitcher throws a wild pitch, and batter happens to swing at it and strike out. You don't go like, oh, that was a great pitch. I should try that again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it's easy when you make it absurd like that, right? Um, you know, and, and conversely, I, I just got to the point where like, I was, I became so used to making decisions all day long every day that I don't, you know, when it comes time to like buy a house, when I knew it was the right house, I'm very much like, you know, I could look for two years for a house. When I see the right one, I'm like, done, bought it. Like, like, you know, and the ability to, to decide like that and then live with the outcome without judging the outcome instead deciding, you know, judging the process is everything. And I see so much in our society government, politics, everything where we're judging the outcomes and not the process. And that boy, if something irks me, especially in the political process these days, um, it's that, you know, it's, uh, it's very much that you, you need the right processes and, and mindset. And again, like I'm not, I don't really love, I'm not much of a sports person, but sports gives you a, a finite arena in with, in which to judge these things. And, um, you know, a great coach makes the right call, um, for football, what, regardless of what that outcome was, they do it again next time, the same way. I'm interested. I mean, the number of decisions you had been making and continue to make today, is there a way you look back and kind of sort through that data or are they kind of just in the back of your mind and you look to them that way? Well, I mean, with trading, it was much easier because you have, you have discrete events and thousands of them. So you can statistically analyze your, your trades and your, 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 you know, the, uh, I don't want to get too technical, but you can, you can, there's, there's enough decisions that are actual trades that win or lose that you can start to see patterns of decisions that you're making. Um, 
And it's much, much harder with the restaurants or with, with talk, um, to judge because you're making so many fewer decisions. Um, you know, we're deciding right now to redo, um, a, an experience at one of our restaurants and it's going to require, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars of investment and architects and, and planning and building. And then you open it up and we won't be able to judge whether or not that was a smart investment for six months. And it's one, you know, you only get to do that like 10 times ever. So at that point you, you have so few data points that it's, it's difficult to know whether that was the right thing to do or not. But at the same time, even if that goes poorly, like I'm good with it. You know, it's like given what I've got right now, it's the best decision to make. When contemplating a huge decision like that in one of your restaurants, how does that even begin? Is it you guys are, are having a few beers one night and you say, you know what, this isn't really working well in our restaurant. Is that usually how it goes? Well, that part's, the part that of what's not working well is definitely driven by data, you know, okay. number of consumers, gotcha. amount of money spent, um, you know, the variance between how many people are getting in on a Tuesday night versus Saturday night. Um, and when we see that it's not living up to our expectations or what we think it could be, um, that's a very different creative process. Then, then I go into like a storytelling mode of going like, well, what, what could we do there that would tell a different story? that would be compelling for diners. You know, what would people want? And oftentimes I go back to like, what, what do I want down there? You know? Um, and then how can we weave that into a narrative that makes sense for, you know, Grant or someone on our staff, or do we have a, a chef that has experience with that sort of thing? Um, and you know, we'll go through a whole bunch of bad ideas, before we get to one that we're really excited by. So there's a lot of times where we go down the path of, of writing this thing up and going, okay, well, let's do this. And then four or five days later you go, eh, that's not, that's not that compelling. I'm not even that excited about it myself anymore. And you just have to be honest about that, right? Like you have to be honest with your good ideas, but even more honest with your bad ones and be a good editor. And eventually you end up getting to one that sticks and everyone kind of goes, yep, you know what? I think that's, that works. Um, and that's, that's where we are. You know, um, I'll be, I'll just tell you, it's like, we're working on the Royster basement. And when we were building the place out, Royster's our casual restaurant where the upstairs is very convivial and a bit loud. And there's a big open hearth with a fire in it. And the basement was meant to be more intimate, but a similar version of upstairs. And what happened is upstairs works so well, no one wants to eat downstairs. So we have this couple hundred thousand dollar kitchen down there and the ability to do, you know, 60 people a night down there. Um, and everyone who got went down there was like, oh, I'm getting shoved in the basement now. I, instead of being, you know, upstairs where the good seating is. So we had to basically come up with a way to make it different and great, but not the same. Like that was the error, you know, when we first built the place and I get it. Like there was definitely a danger. It wasn't like we weren't aware of that, but as soon as we opened, like people started saying that we're like, Oh shit, like that's probably not going to work in the long run. So it's taken us like a good six months of trying to figure out like what we want to do down there. And, and finally we've landed on something, which I'm not going to tell you, but, uh, you'll find out in a little bit, a month or two. And, um, I'm really excited by it, you know, but will it work? I don't know. Like we'll find out in two or three months. Well, I won't even try to press you to ask the question. <laughs> so, so you're tackling this problem and something you mentioned a few minutes ago is you go into storytelling mode and this might sound boring to you, but I would love to know what your actual creative process is like when you're thinking through a new idea. Are you, are you sitting down as a team? Are you journaling? Are you going off on your own? What does that actually look like for you? I pace a lot. Do you really? <laughs> Yeah. I, 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 I like to do loops around my, my, I live in the city and I have a kind of a little walled garden and I kind of, I kind of walk back there, but I, I kind of do it like it's a movie in my head of what it looks like, what it feels like, what the experience is as a diner, what the experience is walking in, what I should feel like. So I get like, a, like I'm doing it right now as you're asking me the question and I'm imagining in my head what it feels like to walk into that space and then what I'm going to order and what I'm going to have. And I, I, it's almost, 
it's almost like a fever dream kind of thing, right? Like where I really imagine it, like I'm watching a movie and when I can watch that movie clearly in my head, then I write it down. And, and when I say watch the movie in my head, I mean, it's like watching a movie. When did you first develop this strategy? I, I asked, I'll, I'll give you a second here. We had on uh, Daniel Silva, one of the legendary bestsellers of all time of spy novels. He does the exact same thing. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't, I, I, again, I don't know how common any of this is, but like, I, I, I have the movie in my head and when it's really, really, really clear, I write it out. Um, when I'm writing, a, when I'm doing public speaking, I never actually write it out. I just do the speech in my head until I've got it clear. And there've been times where I have been ready to go on stage in front of 500 people. And 30 minutes before that, I hear someone, a speaker before me talk about something similar. And I was like, I'm like, Oh God, I'm going to lose everybody instantly. <laughs> if I talk about the same thing, I need a new movie. Like, you know, and I will literally lock myself in a bathroom stall. Uh, I did this for Chicago ideas week about two years ago. And I went into a bathroom stall and just sat there and went like, Oh shit. Okay. Like, what are you going to say when you get out there? And I just rehearsed the thing twice in my head and went out and just did the totally different thing. <laughs> like I told the introducer, I'm like, yeah, skip, skip that whole part about what I'm going to talk about. It's <laughs> um, I, I like getting it to the point where it's very clear and I can see it clearly. And then I write it down. And then like what I do, if I'm really clear on it, I will tell our team, like, I'm really clear on this. Like I got it. Um, and then they will have the unenviable task of trying to extract it from me because honestly, I'm not, I'm not that great at, at doing the teamwork piece of things at that point. I'm just like manic. I'm like, you know, nope, not that. <laughs> <laughs> nope, we won't be doing that. We're going to be doing this other thing. They're like, well, what is it? Ah, you know, trust me. Like we need this, 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 and this. You'll see. Um, so, you know, and sometimes it takes me six months to convince my own employees that like, it's a good idea, which is a great test. You know, if you can't inspire other people to do what you want, um, you're not, you're not very clear, right? So when you're trying to inspire your team, I, I take it back to your storytelling and, and how important that is for you. What do you do differently though, that second, third, fourth, 50th time where they're not, they're not believing that story in the beginning? Yeah, I mean, I, it, it depends. I mean, sometimes it's just like, if you're doing something entirely new, like when we started talk, when we started doing talk, um, my own employees thought it was a terrible idea. My business partner thought it was a terrible idea. Everyone in the industry thought it was a terrible idea. I was absolutely convinced it was a great idea. I hired one programmer and holed up in my bedroom for two weeks. I was just like, fuck it, I'm going to do it. Like, you know, I, I didn't need to convince anyone because that was a testable thing. I could put it out into the world and it would either work or not work. And it worked. Um, it's very rare that I feel that strongly about something, right? So most times I'd kind of go like, oh, well, what am I missing, you know? Um, and I did that for years with that. Like, what am I missing? What am I missing? And finally I was like, I'm not missing anything. Like I got it, you know? Um, other times it's a matter of, of figuring out how to communicate more clearly what it is that you're thinking, what you want to do, which often requires you to sit down and, and write it out. You know, I mean, write out the plan, write out the steps, all those sorts of things. Um, you know, once a year at talk, we do a, kind of a state of the union and, um, whereas a lot of it's informational with our CFO and COO, and this is how many new clients we added. And it's, it's just kind of letting the whole company know, like, Hey, we grew 300% last year and this and that, um, you know, this year I gave a whole piece of talk of like, my job is to think of the 20% of our time or 30% of our time, which is on the asymmetric ideas that, you know, we might do, we might not do. Um, eight months from now that could really move the needle on the industry and the company. And so, you know, if, if I can be clear in those ideas that are kind of more out there, um, that's pretty inspiring. And what I found this year is that when I did that, it was, it was really well received. You know, there's always some skepticism with some folks, 
but that's normal and good. Um, but that's, that's kind of like at, at, as the CEO of a company, that's the kind of stuff I should be working on in my opinion. I'd love to get into the mental model of asymmetric risk in a second, but when you say you write this stuff down, do you have notebooks these are going in or are you just writing on pieces of paper? Do you have these things stored? I can't even write on a piece of paper anymore because my, my handwriting has gone to crap because I just type everything, right? I mean, I, I, I can't, I, it's illegible even to me um, and feels painful, frankly. Uh, no, I, I always am in like a Google Doc or an email to myself. Um, I don't talk them out. I, I type and I, I type is typing and thinking to me are identical at this point. Like I, it's, as I'm thinking, I can type, um, and, uh, it feels very natural and that's, that's what I do. I mean, I just sit down and, and type it out in, in story form, you know, any business plan I have will always have a page about the story of whatever it is. And then it'll have all the spreadsheets and all that afterwards. I asked because I, I don't know if you'd ever do this in a few months. It would be so cool to see your one pager on uh, on the basement idea. Yeah, I've got it actually. Um, and, uh, you know, part of it is that in writing that one pager, I had to come up with a name for things, you know? And uh, it was like, as soon as I came up with the name, I was like, oh, it's so good. Like I'm done. Like, <laughs> oh, it's so good. And, uh, I, it, it was, it was just like, I, I remember just going like, oh, that, that, that thing's done. We hadn't started it. And I was like, that's, that one's done. Like no one's going to push me on that. Once I came up with the, with that one pager in the name, like it was just so good, but that was like over a year and a half of, of fucking around with it. You know, how many of those ideas have you come up with in your life? Five. What do you do when one of those ideas comes? Um, do you have to well, make it come uh, to fruition? First, yeah. I mean, so here's the thing, you know, like when you talk to a lot of people who are, um, I was just, I think it was Chuck close. I, I want to say it's like inspiration is for amateurs. I think was something he said, like a real artist that's grinds shit out every day. <laughs> um, like that's kind of the way I feel about things is like, if you're constantly exercising your, your muscle of trying to bring something new or different into the world. You're constantly thinking like, I can't go to any sort of anything now, any business, any market, any theater or whatever, and not start doing the math in my head of like, well, okay, there's 220 people here. They each paid $20 to the place. It's about 4,500 bucks. Like what else could this place do differently to like improve their, their experience for customers when you walked in the front door? Like I was at a small theater the other day and it was really great production, but the rest of everything else was terrible. And they were kind of lamenting that they were struggling. And I'm like, well, shit, you haven't addressed the 80 other things that make this an experience, you know? Um, I can't help but do that now because I do it so often for my own places, you know? No, I do. And you brought up asymmetric risk a few minutes ago. And a lot of listeners, uh, we would let a few know that you'd be coming on and all of them asked if you could talk about this. So can you kind of give a little framework into, into your mental model, what exactly asymmetric risk is and then how that's shaped your decision making? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, in its simplest form is that you want your, you know, your downside to be one, you want your upside to be five to one, you know, um, it, you know, or 10 to one or whatever it may be. But there are, there are, you know, there are bets that you can make that have a 20% chance of working, but if they work, you know, they pay off 20 to one. I think everyone understands that, right? Like if you look at it like that, but they rarely will do that in their life, right? They like, like how often do you take a bet on 20%, which means that you have an 80% chance of losing and feel great about it, hmm. right? Because chances are you're going to lose. But yet you should still do that every time if the payoff is more than five to one. And, and we are just so intuitively wired to the opposite of that. Because any time that you have an outcome which is perceived as negative, there's this, like, you just feel bad. Like, we're just wired to feel bad. Um, and so people want to, like, lock in their winners and, and, and go, yep. I bought a stock at 100. I sold it at 102. 
Uh, where is it now? Well, it's at 110. Okay, well, selling at 102 was a bad decision. <laughs> I mean, perhaps, maybe it wasn't. But, you know, my point is, is that like everything we're wired to do is to, um, is to not take into consideration the probability of something occurring. And we are terrible estimators of probabilities. Um, you know, it's anyone who's taken a statistics class, which I basically forced my kids to take in high school. Um, we'll learn very, very quickly that we are terrible at, at, in, in, as humans at intuiting the probability of outcomes. And so just even acknowledging, Hey, I'm, I'm just like most people, I'm pretty bad at that gives you the right sort of framework to start going, okay, well, what, what, did, how do I assess this better? And then everything I do now is I try to put myself in a position where the benefit, um, can far outweigh the, the, uh, the downside, you know, um, and that's true in investing, but it's also true. Like we raise money, um, every year for a charity, um, through the Alinea group, uh, for, um, cancer research. And if you think about it, even the way that research is done, um, if you are a 28 year old researcher who desperately wants to get published, you're not going to probably look for funding on something that has a 10% chance of working, even if the outcome of that would be unbelievably beneficial. It'd be a 50 X return on uh, cancer outcomes or something like that. And so what ends up getting funded are incremental small changes, um, that improve, you know, uh, cancer treatment. Um, what we're looking for are the things that are scientifically viable, but have a low probability of working, but give people the space to fail. And because the outcome would be so asymmetric. And that to me is, is exciting. Um, it's the kind of thing that I, you know, I, I just watched that Apollo 11 documentary yesterday and like talk about asymmetric risk. Holy shit. Probability of failure, really, really high. <laughs> you know, it's, there's like watching that movie, even though you know they make it, like we know they made it 50 years ago. They did. Early on in that movie, there's some dude 200 floors up, 200 feet up, like tightening a socket because there's a leak. I'm like, what the fuck is he tightening a socket for? With a wrench. <laughs> so I just, I, I can't, I, I can't, you know. And so like, like, but they pulled it off, like through incredible like teamwork and, you know, an entire energy of a country behind it. But like, that is the very, very, very pinnacle of my mind in asymmetric risk. Um, you know, failure rate, super high. Um, but if you do it, you walk down the moon. Um, and that's why it's so inspirational even 50 years later. Um, we're most of us, like I left that movie going like, I've done nothing in my life. Like, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like. I can't find asymmetric risk that big. Right. Um, but that's also why a guy like Elon Musk gets so celebrated. It's not because like, like starting a car company is absolutely stupid. Right. Like everyone knows that starting a car company is brutal. And then you're going to start a car company. It's going to be all electric. And then, Oh, you know, and so like, even though he's seems like he's a flake, you know, he just gives no fucks. Right. And you're kind of like, he wants to do the most asymmetric things out there. Now we can't all be doing that. Like society would break down, but when it comes time to do whatever it is you're doing, you want to ask out a potential date, make it asymmetric man or woman. <laughs> so, so then what's the most asymmetric thing you've done in your career? Well, I, I, I actually think it's starting a linea. Um, you know, I, I left, uh, you know, trading and, and, um, you know, I could have easily taken a very, very cushy job working for a bit. At that point, I was very successful. Um, and so even though I left my firm, I, I had offers to go, um, you know, make a lot of money at hedge funds or trading firms or, or whatnot. Um, and with no risk at all to my own capital anymore. And instead, I, I decided to open a restaurant. Um, and I knew I wanted to make it a business. Like I wasn't opening it as an art project. Um, I think a lot of people think, oh, people make some money. So they open, you know, we've all seen the celebrities that open a restaurant, right? Cause they can dump a million bucks into something and they want to, they want to 
place to hang out with their friends. Like I haven't eaten at Alinea in four years. Like that's not why I own Alinea. I own Alinea because it's a, it's a great business. So can you give a little context into what makes you then take what you look back on as the biggest risk in your career? When did you know that you were going to open this restaurant? Uh, I knew it on, uh, you know, I think January 28th. Oh, you got an exact date here. <laughs> well, pretty close. Um, I'm within a day or two for sure. Um, and the way I know that is that on January 20th, 2004 was, was my wife's birthday. And we went to trio in Evanston where Grant was the chef for the last time. And that's when he and I had a conversation about like, I'd like to help you open your next place. And four or five or six days later, he emailed me and said, um, you know, I would love to, um, continue to cook for you, but if you're serious, I'd love to sit down and show you my business plan. And, um, instantaneously, I mean, that was like six in the morning when I read that, I instantly knew that that's what I was going to do. Like I, I, I ran upstairs and said to my wife, we're going to open up a restaurant with Grant. And it just seemed, you know, again, the story was in my head. Like I had, I had played it out over the course of months and months and months. If we do X, Y, and Z, this will be the best restaurant in the world. And I knew nothing about running a restaurant, but building that thing, I felt like I could do. I just got chills when you told that, just thinking about that point and then where you guys have come so far. What did, what did Grant do that just made you say, no matter what, I'm going to take this risk with him? You know, every now and then you meet people who are world-class driven, um, great at what they do. Um, if you're, I mean, it's the whole point of your podcast in some ways, right. Is to figure, figure out what makes those people, those people, I guess. And I don't know, I don't know quite why I believed so much in it, but the experience I was having was both emotional and intellectual when I when I went and dined there and it was so different than anything else that was available at the time. Um, and part of it's timing, you know, it's like, it was the right time in my life to do it. Um, it was the right time in his, and it was the right time in the industry to do something different. Um, you know, I, I, we recently published the aviary cocktail book and we've done now over two and a half million dollars in sales since November. Since um, November. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, At least in November, we've done two and a half million in sales and I am convinced and you know, that anybody with a reasonable social media following, um, or have is a previously successful published author will not be using any publishing houses 10 years from now. Like there's just no need to, like, you just don't have to, we just cut out all the middlemen, you know? Um, and so the quality of what we can offer is so much higher than what a publisher can offer because there's two more middle people in that process. So we win, we just win on as long as we can produce a better quality product, which I think a lot of people could, they're limited by the financial model of the publishing industry. Um, it was kind of like that with the restaurants where you could see like things were going to change. This kind of difference was going to happen in the industry and, I'd like to get ahead of that curve. And that's the way I felt about the restaurant industry back in 05. That's the way I felt with the reservations thing in 2010. And that's why talk exists now. And, you know, in publishing, like we're already working on our, our next um, book. And, you know, I mean, that book is, is, is as valuable as any restaurant I could build. So now how, how you've conquered this book industry, are you looking at, other industries through the same framework now? No, not really. Um, I, I don't, I don't have any, any, um, I don't have any more bandwidth. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to it's kind of come up with a way of saying that, but I, I, I have other ideas, but I don't, I don't have the time. And what's interesting is that as I've done more of these sorts of podcasts and I've given public talks. I, I do enjoy, um, I, I, I occasionally spend some time at university of Chicago booth school of business talking to some of the behavioral economists there. Um, Linnea Gandhi is a professor there and she, she does some interesting work and I've talked to a couple of her classes. I'm going to again in May. Um, 
I, you know, Professor Richard Thaler, who won the Nobel Prize, is an investor in talk and um, friend of mine. And so we have these, I have these people come through that, um, that are giving me business plans and whatnot, some of which are pretty good. And I'm encouraging to them, but I'm like, yeah, I just don't have any, I'm, 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 I'm maxed out right now. Um, so, you know, at some point, um, you know, if, if my load lightens ever, I will probably go figure out the next thing I want to do. Um, I do have a couple more books I want to write. I really enjoy the process of sitting down by myself and, and, you know, I wrote uh, life on the line with Grant and, um, I wrote ultimately both voices, you know, he took all the notes, all of his notes and whatnot. And I wrote in his voice as well. And that was a very satisfying thing to do is to write a narrative like that. And so it's something I want to do again in the future. So I asked about what impression Grant left on you. What, what did you leave on him that he said, you know what, I want to do this as well. Well, I think at the time he was just looking for someone with money that could, that could make it. Oh my God. <laughs> um, I, I think he got to my house and looked around and went like, this looks sufficiently well off enough <laughs> Or to do my restaurant. Um, but I, I don't mean this in a demeaning way, but I, I don't think he understood like what running a business was at that point. You know, he was 27 or 28 years old and had been in a kitchen since he was five years old, literally five. And um, so he had never, like when he was doing this, he wasn't thinking, okay, I need to run insurance and payroll and HR team. And I need to hire a, a, an architect so I can get city stamps for the plumbing drawings. Like that was stuff that I had to go like, well, yeah, we can't hire a designer to do this because we need an electrical engineer. Like, and so I think he was just like, will someone work with me to get my vision out of my head and going? And, and I I was the right person for that. We were both very fortunate. I, I have to say like in hindsight. Um, and now it's still, it's still a bit like that at times where like, you know, on the day-to-day operations, he's in the restaurants every day. I'm the one going like, okay, here's what we're working on next. Like we're doing, we're doing this. Um, you know, when I started talk, he didn't, he thought it was like a distraction. He was like, I don't, I don't get it. I don't think you should be working on this. So then how do you get that across to your business partner that what you're doing actually does add a ton of value? Uh, exactly what you just said. Say, listen, you little shit. <laughs> <laughs> We, and I mean that in a good way. Like we, we've got, uh, we have a kind of relationship where, where we are both very bullheaded people. So, um, you know, it's, it's pretty funny. Like this guy's one of the best chefs in the world and he'll occasionally like take a snapshot in the kitchen of a dish that he made. And he was like, let's see you make that asshole. I'm like, I can't do that. Of course I can't. I'm not a chef. You know, but it's funny. Like we have that brotherly kind of competition after 15 or 16 years. Right. Um, and we're both only children, which I think makes a lot of sense as well. And, um, and we're super competitive with each other. So, um, that's been positive net net. One thing I've been intrigued about is I I think it was six or seven years before you guys decided to open up another restaurant. Was that discipline or like you mentioned a few minutes ago, you were just spread too thin. No, I wasn't at the time I wasn't spread all that thin because all we had was Alinea. Um well first of all, he almost died of cancer in the middle there. Um, which is not a small thing. I mean, we were eighteen months into Alinea and he was diagnosed with stage four tongue cancer, um, which had metastasized to his lymph nodes and, and his neck. Um and so, you know, at that point it was a matter of making sure that he survived and had good quality of life. Um, also made it very easy to assess what we had done with Alinea, which was build something from scratch, go from zero to name number one restaurant in America, um, in 18 months. And, uh, that was very satisfying. And honestly, at that point, I thought that was the end of my restaurant career. And you know what? I was fine with it. Like, you know, given the, the scope and scale of, what was going on with, with his life and the fact that he had two small kids and he was going to die, um, made it very easy to not worry about our expansion or anything to do with the business, you know? Uh, and then afterwards, similarly, I was kind of like, well, he just needs to heal and get better. And then I also made me like, go like, well, do I really want to do another, do I want to do more of this? 
Um, because in my mind at some point in there, I had already gone like, okay, like after he dies, I'm going to shut Alinea, you know? Um, so I had to really assess what it is I wanted to do as well. And, um, you know, again, it was like both through work and a little inspiration and, and a little bit of like luck, you know, the idea for next restaurant came to me. And, um, once Grant put the first menu idea out there, Paris 1906, um, that's when I was like, okay, let's go find a piece of real estate. Um, and you know, I had the idea for the aviary, um, about the same time. And so we just did both. Um, and man, it was, it was really satisfying to, to open both of those and have them both do so well. I mean, next one, best new restaurant in America, aviary has been named best bar in America a couple of times. Um, but it was less satisfying than doing Alinea in many ways because, uh, the outcome was less uncertain. You know, for me, part of it is like the more, the more crazy it seems, the much more satisfying it is to do it. I think that's normal, right? Especially with your framework of uh, asymmetric risk. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. Like it, it just wasn't any restaurant I do now is less and less risk. So it's, I, I find the asymmetry in the, in what we do now more in the deal than the actual restaurant itself, which is altogether a bit more boring because I'm essentially leveraging my position at this point. No, that makes perfect sense. And I didn't want to jump past Grant's diagnosis, his battle. I know yeah, chef's uh, table. Yeah. Chef's table on Netflix does a, a great job kind of documenting the behind the scenes there. I, I'm interested though with, I know he didn't take much time off at all during his sickness but would you be coming more involved in being in the restaurant? Do you think that's the key thing that helped you develop talk? Yeah. I mean, the more and more I got involved in what was going on in Alinea, both, you know, just before he got ill, um, while he was sick and, and the time afterwards, um, the more time I spent looking at, at restaurant operations in general, the more I would ask questions that were, naive, you know? Um, and also I would, I would look to our own employees motivation and, and what, what motivated them to, you know, we would do 70 diners on a Wednesday night, even though we had a wait list of a hundred people. And then on a Saturday night, we do 84 diners. Um, that 14 diners difference is a huge difference. Um, if we did 14 more diners on Wednesday, Thursday and Sunday, like that's an extra 42 people a week, you know, that's a lot over the course of a year. Why aren't we doing that? And, you know, I'd get answers that would be like, basically like, well, no skin off my ass if we don't like, they wouldn't say that, but the incremental benefit to an employee is just more work. So it told me that some of our incentives were misaligned. It told me that I needed to take greater control of my own business. Um, I still see every day, restaurants that rely on the general manager to book the restaurant, which is a massive error. That general manager is probably not incentivized as much as the owner would think to maximize the revenue of that restaurant. They're, they're, they want to maximize the lack of chaos on a given night. You're constantly looking, like you brought up earlier, no one has a good answer to this. And it's so much clearer now throughout this discussion on how you view these problems and something you said a second ago that really intrigued me about the kind of beginner's mindset and asking these almost naive questions. Is that essential in any industry you're in? Absolutely. Um, you know, I can't like going back to the publishing thing for a second, when we Grant really wanted to do an Alinea cookbook. Um, and then when he was ill, that became even more important to him to document that like he thought like that he was going to die. And one of the things he wanted to do was get it down on paper. So he could kind of go like, well, that was, that's what I did when I was alive. Um, which I think is a very, you know, basic human emotion to have, right. Going back to like the cave drawings and stuff. So, you know, I, I started talking to publishers and getting offers and then asking questions because like, how do you assess, if I offered you $50,000 to write a book right now, 
your first question shouldn't be like, can I get 60? It's how much does it cost to print a book? (laughs) Which is a very different question, right? And as soon as you find out that you can't answer that question easily or that they won't answer it, hang up the phone and go figure it out because someone's not telling you something for a reason. Um, the motivations of, of the other people you're doing business with are way more important than your own. Um, your own, you, you already know and get, um, the other ones you need to kind of, you know, you need to Sherlock Holmes them a little bit. And in the case of publishing, like books cost almost nothing to print. Um, and when I found out like how much money that a publisher could make off of a, a cookbook, um, it became very, very, very clear to me that, um, it was kind of like signing an independent band to a record contract. It's like, you know, you give a band a two or $300,000 advance to record, you own the, uh, the recording studio, which gets paid the $300,000, um, to, you know, to do that. And then the band earns out, you know, a 10% of, of sales. Right. Um, so that until you get $300,000 more back, they get nothing more. Um, you really can't lose you know, and that's the way I felt about, about the cookbook publishing industry. Um, and I published all that. I've got a medium post on where I, I detail all of those, um, all those numbers. And that's the other thing too, is I'm very transparent about it. Like, you know, I, am happy to shout from the hilltops, like, Hey, this is why I did this. This is what, what, you know, what I was offered. Um, I put all those offers right up there. And, um, you know, when I, I think when I talk to some, some people, they always go like, Oh, well, it's easy for you to do that because you're a linear. And I go like, no, no, no. Like you have to understand we did that. we made that decision in 2006 before you ever heard of a linear. Hmm. Um, and we're a linear because we did stuff like that. Like the reason that we're successful is because we did things different when we built a linear and because we turned down that, that, you know, first cookbook offer and did it ourselves. And because we decided to do a restaurant that changes every four months and sell prepaid reservations to it. And, you know, like all of those things are what made the reputation. And yeah, now we can rely on that where our, our chances of success are much greater, but the way we got here was by asking those naive fundamental questions. And then, you know, I think most people, when they can't find that answer, just go like, Oh, well, I don't know how much book gets, you know, how much it costs to print that book. And I'm like, well, someone goddamn somewhere knows. How much it costs. <laughs> like for me, it was the French laundry cookbook. Like I couldn't, like everyone knows it's like one of the best selling high end cookbooks out there. Grant actually worked on it. So he saw the production of it all right in Thomas's dad's kitchen, right next to the French laundry. Um, by all accounts, one of the most successful books ever and influential books ever in, in high end cookbooks. Nobody could tell me how many it sold and how much it cost to print. That's mind blowing. You can't look it up. Try to look it up online. You won't find it like crazy. So, so then, you know, it's like, well, let's, tr- you know, track down the printer. Someone's going to tell me. And that's fun too, by the way. I love shit like that. No, this is why I'm so fascinated by this. I mean, this is a very unique skill. Like you said, this almost Sherlock Holmes approach. When do you first remember doing this? Was it during the book? I mean, no, I like, like even with the poster stuff, I was like that. Like, I, I don't know. I always, I always find that fascinating. Like who doesn't love a good mystery, right? Like, of course, everyone loves a good mystery. And in business, they're all over the place. You know, um, it's, it's, it's always fascinating to me. Like there's a startup here in Chicago and I, I I won't say the name to this one where I cannot figure out how they got the valuation they got or the raise the money they got or what exactly they even do. (laughs) You could go to their, you could go to their website and you could look at the website. There's a lot of buzzwords and catchphrases in there, but you can't figure out what they do exactly. Right. And you can't really figure out who their clients are. And yet the business press writes about them in kind of glowing terms and they've raised supposedly a ton of money. And I could not figure out how anyone would put this money into this company when I can't even figure out what they do. There is no clear statement of what they do. And eventually I think I figured it out. Like, I think it's, I think it's like 
well, I don't really want to say because it would kind of give away what it is, but I think that there's a, a way that they're taking money in and, 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 uh, you know, through, through various reasons and taxes and real estate and all that sort of stuff. There's probably, probably operates more like a, like a REIT than it does a technology firm. Um, man, it probably took me a year to figure that out. Every time I'd drive by it, like I'd see the sign and I'd go like, what is it that they do exactly? <laughs> like I would Google and I, and like, and then I'd read the press. Like, here's the other thing. Like, I don't think I don't like, I'm not big on fake news, but I'm very big on lazy news. Um, when you are in the press a lot or your company is in the press or your competitors are in the press, um, there's an article yesterday that one of our competitors to talk might be sold. And, um, it stated that they had 4,000 domestic clients and 10,000 international clients. And that's just like patently wrong. Like, and then that's been repeated over and over and over again in the press. And what drives me nuts is it's not that hard to count. <laughs> Good point. Like, go, on their, go on their app or their website and count the restaurants. And here's the thing. You don't need to count all 4,000 to figure out that when you're halfway done, you're at like 1,200. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, like no one bothers to just go like, is that true? And it's just lazy. It's part of the news cycle being so fast now. And so I see this all the time with businesses, but I also see it internally with businesses where, you know, I'll get a business plan. And one of the first things I do is I'm like, this doesn't make sense. Um, not does it make internal sense? Like, is it internally consistent? Sure. But I can look at numbers and just go like, I don't believe this shit. Like, and you know, at that point, I don't, I don't even have to have a conversation. Like, I'm not gonna, I'm not even gonna ask them if it's true or not. I just know it's not. And that's the end of that. So fascinated by by how you uncover problems, how you view the world. I'm interested through your lens. What's one of the most unique things someone did to impress you? Man, I don't know. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I think. Anytime that someone sees, I just, I made an investment in a, in a cool little company called made in cookware and over the last, just last week and over the last 10, 12 years, we've had every cookware company in the country come to us and want us to sponsor or, or help them start it or this or that. Right. And I, um, someone introduced me to these guys and said, Hey, what do you, you know, we're thinking about investing in this. VC. And I want you to take a look at it. And as soon as I went to their website, I was like, Oh, this is really well done. And then I emailed them and said, yeah, I'm kind of curious to talk to you guys because it looks like what you've done is pretty cool. And then, um, I got to my office next morning and two of their products were on my desk. Um, okay. Like a lot of people send me stuff and I don't want free stuff, but before the conversation, that's a really smart thing to do. Right. Mm Mm-hmm. And then when they got on the call, they went, well, we wanted you to see it because seeing it in person is different than us holding it up in a video call and and showing it to you. Um, And so that level of preparedness is really smart, right? Like who doesn't love that? And then rather than having a deck and, and all that stuff, they just told their story. Like, you know, they just went like, here's who I am and why I'm doing this. Um, this is my business partner and he went through what he's good at and all that. And I instantly liked them. And then when I asked them about the business questions, it was just evident that they didn't need to refer to anything. Like they knew it cold, like they lived it. And when you live something day to day and you've got that in your head, I don't need to understand all of it. I know you do, <laughs> you know, and I kind of went, what can I do for you? And the right answer to that question is not give me your money, right? Like you can get money from a lot of sources. What can I do to help you? And they had ready answers for that. Like that, that was what they were hoping that I would say. Um, and I was just really impressed. And a week later we invested money and, um, I have probably haven't made an outside investment in like two and a half years. Um, so I was just impressed with their, their, fortitude, but also how well they knew what they wanted to do. Like they really knew what their goals were. The conversation comes full back and and ties back to the ability to tell story. 
and you're yeah. an incredible storyteller. I know the listeners are really going to enjoy this one. I, I could go on for hours continuing this conversation with you, Nick. So I do appreciate the time. Where can the listeners best stay connected with you? What do you want them checking out? Uh, well, you know, I've got Twitter uh, at Nick Kokonis, um, Instagram N Kokonis, and uh, I'm I'm very easy to find <laughs> beyond that. <laughs> Um, so, uh, if you Google me up, there's something on there, um, on, on the interwebs, as they say, for sure. And, uh, you know, um, the Alinea group.com is also a good spot to see everything we're working on. Great. Well, we'll make sure we have everything linked up so they can find you easily enough. But Nick Kakonis, I can't thank you enough for joining us on what got you there. Thank you so much, Sean. Hey guys, I want to tell you about the brand I'm obsessed with right now. And you guys know I'm pretty obsessive about the brands I work with, especially when it comes to athletic apparel. You guys need to check out 10,000. You need to head to 10,000.cc and you guys can enter code WGYT and you're going to receive 20%, yes, 20% off your entire order. Why do I love 10,000? 10,000 created the only training shorts you'll ever need. They do so by simplifying your options to deliver three premium shorts that perfectly cover all the ways you train. They have one built for versatility, another for durability, and one super lightweight, perfect for one of those runs or whatever else you do for fitness. No matter what you do, they have you covered. CrossFit, running, spin, yoga, lifting, or your weekend adventure, it doesn't matter what you do for fitness. They have a short for every way you train. They make it super simple too to find the right short. Just pick the short that's best for you, your lifestyle, personalize it with your individual needs with a custom liner and inseam options and start getting after it. Not sure if they have the right short? No need to worry, you guys. Make a return or exchange. They offer free shipping, free exchanges, and free returns on every order. Like I said, 10,000 is my favorite brand right now. I am wearing their apparel all the time when I'm working out. I can't recommend them enough. Head to 10,000.cc, enter code WGYT, and you've got 20% off your entire order. You guys know how much I love travel. So I think you're really going to like this next brand. That brand is Globekick. Head to globekick.com, check out what they've got going on, and you can also enter code WGYT to receive 10% off. Globekick makes your travel dreams a reality. They make it easy to discover, plan, and enjoy unforgettable adventures. And you're wondering what some of those adventures are? How about a yoga retreat in Italy? Cage diving with great whites in South Africa? Or their most recent trip was dog sledding and chasing the Northern Lights. Yes, they saw the Northern Lights. I think you guys would love checking them out. So head to globekick.com, enter code WGYT, and you've got 10% off. What got you there with Sean Delaney? Uh, what got you there with Sean Delaney? What got you there with Sean Delaney? Uh, what got you there with got you, got you? Thanks for listening to another episode of What Got You There. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a review on iTunes and also share with your friends. Thanks so much. Looking forward to talking with you next time. If you want to stay up to date on all things I'm working on behind the scenes and everything we've got going on at What Got You There, head over to whatgotyouthere.com. You'll also be able to see more on podcast guests and what they're doing. Thanks to Justin Great for providing us the intro and outro song. If you like his music and want to find out more about what he's working on, head over to justingreat.com.